morning. I'm Sarah Colvin, and joining me on the phone, I welcome our Cape and Island State Senator, Dan Wolf. Senator Wolf, good morning. Good morning, Sarah. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Uh, great. Great to be here with you. So uh, I want to talk uh, really about this, this really interesting, um, you know, it's, it's, it shocks me. I mean, I guess it should, nothing should shock me anymore. But in, in 2016, we're still talking about a gender pay gap and uh, something at the end of January that the Senate passed uh, a, a, a pay equity legislation that's going to go a long way to help close that up a little bit more. Well, we certainly hope so. I mean, back when uh, President Kennedy uh, was the president in 1963 and signed the Equal Pay Act. Uh, the average woman earned 59 cents on the dollar. Uh, at that point, you weren't born, and I was only six years old, so I don't think we can be accountable for that. But in the 53 years since then, we've closed the gap, and in Massachusetts right now, women earn about 80 cents on the dollar. And I would have to say that in 53 years, that's just not enough progress. When when I came of age and was at college, the number was about 69 cents on a dollar. So you can see the gap has been narrowing over time, but it's kind of an embarrassment in this day and age that, you know, women are making basically 80 cents on the dollar of what men make. Absolutely. It just amazes me that that practice continues. And I think about, you know, so many of the powerful women here on Cape Cod running organizations, executive directors, you know, higher ups at banks, things like that. So certainly, you know, women are in these leadership roles and these top jobs. And it's troubling that uh, not in, in every circumstance uh, they may may not be making uh, what, what they're worth. No, I mean, imagine if, if every time you went to pay for something as a woman, you had a, a discount of 20 percent that you were only paying 80 percent of what the man paid. Because in effect, if you're if you're uh, getting paid 80 percent of what a man is being paid, you could argue that you should only have to pay 80 percent of what a man pays when you buy something. That that would make sense, wouldn't it? Now of there's course. a concept, right? <laughs> exactly, but certainly that, uh, that, that was not, however, a part of this legislation. Exactly. So tell me a little bit about this legislation. You know, really interesting to think about that uh, Massachusetts was the first state to pass a pay equity law more than 70 years ago, and now here we are. Uh, the, at least the Senate uh, passing another one at the end of January. So tell me a little bit, uh, Dan, about what's included in this legislation. Well, it, it gets to defining uh, comparable work so that. You know, the hardest part about this, era is to make sure that the jobs that we're talking about, where we're looking at a pay differential, uh, actually are jobs that entail doing uh, comparable work. So one of the things that this bill does is it tries to outline for companies what is considered to be comparable work, so that men and women at least were comparing apples and apples. One of the other things it does is, um, if you remember the Lily Ledbetter um, case that, that hit the courts a few years ago, and she was actually terminated because she had had a conversation with coworkers about what she was getting paid versus what they were getting paid. And her, her employer said, no, you can't have those conversations. We actually prevent or prohibit the employer from not allowing those conversations. So that on the workplace, at the workplace, if employees want to discuss what they're getting paid with each other, they can. Because one of the things that we've determined over the years is prohibiting those kinds of conversations uh, keeps it in the dark. So... We address that. What we also do there, which I think is a, is a great carrot versus a stick, is we say to employers, um, if you actually can demonstrate that you are looking at this, that you have a program in place where your uh, HR department or where you're actively looking at what men make versus what women make, then you're held harmless if a case is brought against you or it can be used as what's called an affirmative action in a lawsuit that might be uh, brought against you ever for uh, unequal or discriminatory pay, pay practices. So I love that aspect of the law because the company I run, for example, uh, we do look at that and we actively look at it. So if we're ever challenged in a pay equity case, we'll be able to say, look, you know, this is something that we look at from an, uh, on an ongoing uh, perspective and uh, therefore do the best that we can. And I think intent goes a long way in this regard. It certainly does, and I can imagine how it could be challenging, um, you know, when, when we're dealing with, obviously, there's, there are some cut-and-dry jobs where, you know, this is the job, this is what it pays, but then when you're looking at it, I'm thinking, you know, we're looking for a new town manager here in the town of Barnstable, and, uh, you know, that's, that's where the salary is commensurate with experience, so would a woman get paid less than a man, or, or how are you going to compare um, those experience points um, alongside a, of gender, or is it something that you can't even look at? Um, well... It's a great point, and one of the things, uh, interestingly enough, that we've done is we have eliminated that discussion from the interview process. So if, someone, if a woman comes in for an interview, 
uh, they're not allowed to be asked, well, what is it you're making at your prior job? Because, again, a lot of this is fact and, and experience-based. What we found is a lot of the reason there's hangover for women getting paid less is, the, is that they're always asked, what are you getting paid now? And then that drives what the offer is when there's an offer coming. So it really should be a basis of what the employer uh, is willing to pay and what the job is worth uh, based on the experience of the applicant, but not necessarily what the applicant was being paid in their prior job. Exactly. So they can't base a current salary or a new salary on that that previous salary. That's that's a provision that's, right. that's in this. Uh, so other other key points of this bill and then perhaps uh, some of the, the next steps for this. Well, those are the main provisions that, um, first of all, employees uh, can and should, if they choose, uh, be able to discuss what their compensation is at the workplace. The definition of comparable work to make sure that employers are really looking at jobs that are comparable. Um, the necessity of them to actually have some kind of plan in place, which then serves as a defense should they ever be taken to court. Um, I think those are the main provisions of the bill. And they're not posting... Uh, or not asking what the woman uh, made or what the man made at the prior job, just so that there's not hangover, uh, in, in a way, institutionalizing lower pay for women. I think those are the those are the big provisions. I think the real question now is going to be whether the whether the House of Representatives even takes up an equal pay bill, an equity bill, and whether Senator ba uh, sorry whether Governor Baker will be willing to sign such a bill. So the fact that we did it in the Senate is not a guarantee that it will get done. Um, it's really kind of unique legislation uh, nationally. I think a couple other states have done it. But, again, it's an opportunity for Massachusetts to take a national lead on an issue. And I'm really excited and hopeful that we will do that. And now, Dan, some critics of this bill have said that it could put companies at risk uh, for lawsuits if some of the provisions uh, aren't, aren't followed uh, to, to the letter. Is that something that you see as a concern uh, moving forward should this pass and get signed by Governor Baker? Yeah, anytime you you increase... Uh, regulatory requirements or you, you institute laws, there's always a risk that employers who aren't complying um, have exposure. But again, you know, what we're trying to mandate here is that women get paid the same as men. And you know, I would argue that if companies are worried that by not complying to that requirement, they're leaving themselves open to lawsuits, the easiest way to fix it is actually to pay women the same as men for comparable work and or at least have a program in place where you're doing the deep dive, you're doing the analysis, so that you can demonstrate, if you get audited, that you have a plan in place or a program in place to make sure that you're not discriminating. Look, nobody would say, Sarah, that they intentionally are discriminating. The reality is, uh, 1963 to now, this is over 60 years later, uh, women have only gone from making 60 cents roughly to 80 cents roughly on a dollar. So clearly intent doesn't do it because I think the intent is there. Uh, this is to actually put the sticks and carrots in place so that uh, employers take a good hard look at this and so that we close the gap uh, quicker than we have been over the last 60 years. Indeed. And, and you know, for, for myself as, as a woman in a professional career, I can see the importance of something like this. Uh, but, but for you and, and really for all of the supporters, uh, what, what, is the, what is the main reason why something like this is so important? Well, it's important because those of us who have daughters in the workplace, spouses in the workplace, and who just believe in overall uh, economic fairness and economic justice, uh, this is something that is long overdue. This is a case where justice delayed has been justice denied, and it's time that we get it right. And, you know, I look at this for my three daughters. I look at it for all of the women in the workplace and the spouses. And the other thing to remember, Sarah, you and I have had this discussion, is over the past uh, 30 or 40 years, um, the economy really requires that both uh, uh, both partners in a couple work and that everybody is in the workplace trying to make ends meet. And the idea that there are single mothers out there and spouses who are not getting paid uh, the same as men and can't contribute to the household income and to making ends meet to the degree that men can just isn't right in this day and age. So I think it's really about fairness and justice and I love the fact that in Massachusetts we once again have the uh, opportunity to play leader. Wonderful. Senator Wolf, I thank you so much as always for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here on Barnstable this morning, and we will check in with you again in a couple of weeks. Have a great day. Always a pleasure, Sarah. Thanks very much. Have a great day. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye. Cape and Island State Senator Dan Wolf joining us as he does every other Tuesday morning here on Barnstable this morning. Morning, come. I'm